uh, pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the Curl people for inviting me. Um, I have a lot of stuff to give you today. So I just want to warn, don't be overwhelmed. Just see you know, what you can pick out that works for you. Well, there's, there's six essential concepts. And I will explain them as we go along. We're going to start with the learner. That's essential with heritage language teaching, that you don't want to start with the curriculum. You want to start with the learner. And I'll explain what that means. Next, I'm going to talk about a macro-based approach, top-down approach. Then we're going to move to a, what a project-based approach is. We're going to talk about how to teach grammar and language more generally within a project-based or a macro-based approach. Now, essential concept five, I'm not going to get, I'm guessing I'm not going to get to present separately. That's why it's in gray. A little bit of differentiation. So what I've decided to do is I will stick in little bits of information about differentiation. It's possible that I'll have a little bit of time at the end to talk about differentiation, so I've included an extra little bit on the presentation at the end if we have time. If not, I can send you the presentation and you can look at the bit on differentiation. And then the last concept I want to talk about, the big ideas. Um, big ideas are important in differentiation because you want to be moved, you want um, the big ideas driving instruction rather than the little points. Again, it's in gray because I won't be able to give you a separate presentation on it, but it's in the handout. If you want to, you can be following along with the handout or you'll get to use the handout for a couple of activities that I will be asking you to do. But it's all there. I've tried to summarize everything that I'm going to be um, talking about today. It's all in the handout. So without further ado, let's start with the learner. There are these three populations that we kind of need to know in order to understand our heritage language learners. It's not just about understanding the, learn the heritage language learner, but understand how they are in some ways like native speakers and in some ways like L2 learners. Uh, let's listen to this and come back to the same question. But now I want you to think in terms of defining traits. Defining traits are things that define a, a class of speakers or, 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 or birds or whatever it is. What it is that has to be there in order for you to be considered a heritage language learner. And then there's also characteristics. These things can be there, but they don't necessarily have to be there. So we're going to listen to Arturo. My name's Arturo Diaz, and I was born in East Los Angeles. Uh, my mother is Cuba, Cuban, and my father is Mexican. Uh, I grew up in, my, in a household where we pretty much spoke Spanish uh, from childhood. Um, I was raised mainly with my grandmother as well, and I, I actually thank my grandmother for keeping Spanish alive <laughs> with me because uh, she didn't speak a word of English, and so I always had to speak Spanish with her if I wanted to eat. And that's what I tell everyone. If I wanted to eat, I needed to speak Spanish to her. I grew up with my grandmother, and uh, we did a lot of errands together. Um, I always had to translate for her, so I, we would, wherever we would go, uh, supermarket, bank, or whatnot, I, even, I was maybe just like six years old. And you know, in retrospect, I was already a translator back when I was six years old. And then when my grandmother passed away, and that was also at around college, that's where Spanish really took a big turn for me because it was always a connection with my roots. And my grandmother sort of uh, forced me to do to always be in touch with my roots, and when I lost her, I, um, I almost stopped speaking Spanish because my mother would just she got used to just speaking English with me, and then all of a sudden I was the one who like changed. I said, "No, my roots are Spanish." Well, actually, my roots are Cuban. My my father passed away uh, when I was 11 years old. And so I don't know much about the Mexican part of my family, but I know I've always been exposed to the Cuban part. And so uh, th th I associate myself with a Cuban descent. And so I started to speak Spanish to my mother all the time, and I still do. I never speak English to her. I always just speak Spanish because it is my connection to my roots. And, and, and for me, Spanish, 
it's not just, it, it is me. It is my identity. Who am I? What am I? Um, I'm an American, that's true, but I can't negate my Cuban roots. And it's gotten to the point that English for me, it, 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 it comes out so fluently for me because I'm, I'm, I, I was educated completely in English, never had any formal training in Spanish. But it almost hurts that English is so dominant in my life and I'm so good at it and I don't have that same facility with Spanish. Now, of course, I've never, like I said, I haven't been trained for, uh, I have no formal instruction in Spanish, but that doesn't mean I can't read or write. Uh, I've, but I took it upon myself. I, I remember when I was, e even when I was young, when I was young, I would look, over, look at the magazines that my grandmother would read, and they were always in Spanish. And I would just start looking through them, and I, by then I already spoke English. I, I could read English. So, you know, it was just a one small step to start reading Spanish. I mean, it's pretty much through the Latin alphabet. So I, I think I taught myself <laughs> how to read Spanish. And in terms of writing, I've never actually had much formal training in it, but I, I can write Spanish. Isn't that a wonderful um, little narrative? So let's go back to the question. I asked, what, from listening to Arturo, what do you think are the defining traits? So remember, defining traits are the things that must be present in every member of the category. What do you hear Arturo talking about that you say is a defining trait of heritage language speakers or learners? So can you be a heritage speaker and have formal training? Yeah. Sure, right? Uh, that's usually where we want to take them. Right? So it is a characteristic and it's something very important. Um, the son of our, uh, the director of the National Heritage Language Resource Center is Russian born. And Olga said to me that her son doesn't feel, she, he speaks Russian, but he doesn't feel any emotional attachment to Russia. But he's still a heritage speaker of Russia. So that's a characteristic that's present in many. That's why it's so important. But it's not any a defining trait. So the I, connection with the culture. And where does that connect? Where is that connection built or created? At home. It's the family thing, right? So family connection is the defining trait of heritage language learners. And there's another dimension, especially for Spanish. Range of interaction is limited. Here's what I mean. Native speakers have what we call the full range of interaction. Not all native speakers have the same range, right? Educated native speakers have a bigger range of interaction, maybe, than non-educated, or have that added dimension of education, right? Uh, native speakers of Spanish from 200 years ago had a different range of interaction from native speakers today, right? Today we go online and all this other stuff, right? But the point is that native speakers have the full range of interaction for, their li for the lives they le lead, right? L2 learners at the other extreme have a much more limited range of interaction. Typically, that interaction takes place in the classroom setting. For most of them, it can go beyond that if they become, as they become more proficient and more advanced. Native speakers are somewhere in the middle. They have the home range, right? But what happens is around age five, then they go to school. And it's at that point where input is diminished because they go to an English-speaking school. And remember, acquisition continues all the way to about age 18. So input is drastically diminished at starting around age 5 with consequences that, uh, for language learning, right? So some of the other things that are mentioned here are characteristics that can vary. So as you mentioned, they typically have, most of them have very little in the way of formal education, but some of them have for, some formal education, right? I have students that arrive from Mexico because I'm in California. I have students that arrive from Mexico um, maybe at age 12, 13. Those students have a fair amount of formal education in Spanish. So that can vary. Notice that foreign language learners tend to have a lot of education. These are the defining characteristics. Why do our learners, why do our HR learners come to us? For many reasons, but we did a survey at UCLA and these emerged as the top three reasons. 
for Spanish and those other two languages, Chinese and Japanese, it was to make professional use. That was their top reason, which stands to reason. These are languages where there are professional opportunities. And then um, identity, communicating with family and friends in the US, that's important. They're not looking to communicate with people in Spain or even Mexico. They're looking primarily to communicate here. And then in third place, for most of them, fourth place for Spanish, communicating with people abroad. What kinds of activities um, can help accomplish these goals or further these goals? Do you guys do linguistic autobiographies? Those are very valuable, right? And that's what Arturo was doing in this, um, in this video I showed you. Surveys, community surveys, uh, interviewing speakers, which is what's done in the spin test, right? And finding or creating resources for the communities. Keep this in mind as I move to a project-based um, presentation, the project-based bit of this presentation, because these are possible things you can do. What we see is that heritage language learners, with regard to some things, are like native speakers. They have that home connection. They have some input, the kind of input that defines what it means to be a native speaker, right? Uh, functional skills that are somewhat similar to those of native speakers. But in other ways, they are like L2 learners in the sense that they have a limited range of interaction in the language. So, what this means is that for some things, we want to decide how we teach, why we teach, and then um, what we teach it with native speakers in mind for some things, right? For other things, we want to keep the L2 learner in mind because for some things, HL learners will be like L2 learners. And then there are some HL only zones, the non-overlapping areas here right, where it's them and they're not like anybody else, okay? So let's talk a little bit about those zones. I'm going to keep bringing them up um, throughout this presentation. Here is, um, this comes from a book I wrote. Most of the research has been done on Latino students, academic research, but the research really is in the background. It's the voices of U.S. Latinos that, that I use to bring up, acquaint teachers, administrators, whatever, with what it means, how, what it means to grow up Latino in the United States. What are some of the things that, um, that impact Latino youth? And this is something my student says, which I think captures the essence of HL teaching in red. But let me start from the beginning. In high school, I was one of very few Latinos. My friend and I were called the Mexican kids. This was always funny to me because my dance family always told me I was American. In school, I was labeled Mexican, but to the Mexicans, I am an American. I'm part of each, but not fully accepted by either. In high school, I was considered Mexican because I, spoke, um, because I spoke Spanish, but I was considered pocho by my dad's family because my Spanish was not up to their standard. It's this weird duality in which you're stuck in the middle. Latinos are often told that they're not Americans, but also that they're not connected to their heritage. And here in red comes a prescription for HL teaching. You take pride in both cultures and learn to deal with the rejection. You may never be fully embraced by either side, that's why you seek out other people like yourself. Socializing with people who share a common experience helps you deal with this experience. So this student, in effect, is telling us he, I can't remember if it's a he or a she, it, is coming to, to study Spanish because he wants that experience of socializing with people who have had, you know, have had to deal with the rejection, who have to deal with living in between two worlds, and who are bilinguals, who are full bilinguals, um, et cetera. So you want to think about that when you uh, decide on activities, tasks, authentic materials, right? Back to this, that heritage speakers are somewhat like native speakers. Think about the Arturo clip I showed you. What did we do with that clip? We can think of ourselves as native speakers of English, right? How did we use that, that text, that clip? What did I start, what did we do? I, I showed it to you and then you talked about it, right? Right? So that's typically what we do as native speakers. We use it to get, we use authentic materials to get information, 
right? And then we start to dissect it. Well, what do we, if we want more information, we start to go, well, what do you think of it? What he said about this, what he said about that. Did I start out by saying, pay attention to Arturo's use of the past tense? No, right? So that's kind of the starting point when you think of native speakers, right? Now let's think about L2 learners. You have to pretend you heard this clip in Spanish and you're going to present it in Spanish in your classroom. So think second or third year of Spanish. Could you give your L2 learners, could you just show them that clip if it were all in Spanish and expect them to follow and then come right back with the kind of comments you came back with? No. So what do you have to do when you have L2 learners? You kind of have to scaffold the language a little bit, right? You have to prepare them. So for some things, for some materials, you're going to have to scaffold. For other materials, you can just jump right in, right? So heritage language learners will have different entry points to different materials, and it's a judgment call on your part as to what the entry points are, right? And, and that brings me to the next topic, which is the macro base. By macro, I mean top down. Okay, now I wrote a paper, I think I cited it, on macro-based approaches. It's in press, it's a second citation, so we're not, we're going to a great deal of detail with macro-based teaching. But anyways, for now, this is an, an overview. Macro-based teaching looks this way. You start with the big picture, with the text, sort of like you do with native speakers, what we did here with the Arturo clip, right? And then you move to form focus instruction. What do I mean by form focus instruction? Language, right? Okay, let's compare that with micro or bottom up. Notice with micro, it's what we do in our classes. We start out with form focus instruction and we move to a reading or an authentic task. Why do we follow that order? for what the reasons I already gave you. If you just give this clip to your uh, L2 learners, they're not gonna be able to follow. So you have to prepare them a little bit, right? Now, we all use textbooks, different textbooks, right? But typically an L2 textbook, how does it start? It'll give you, you know, in this unit, you're going to learn about the past tense, so you're going to be able to use it in this context, and you're gonna learn vocabulary about the family. I'm just making it up. Right? And then you progress, you start building on it, you build on it, you build on it, until you get to what, what typically happens at the end of a unit. You have readings, right, or a movie, or you know, something, it's real authentic material. But by then you've been prepped so that you can use the authentic material, right? Now, imagine starting the unit from the other end with the text, and then you move backwards with your chapter or unit. That's the macro approach. Different entry points, sort of opposite entry points, but the same material is covered, right? So both approaches have form focus instruction. I'm not here to tell you no form focus instruction with heritage language learners. There's a lot of research now that shows that heritage language learners benefit from form focus instruction. So we don't want to deny them that. Both instructions have this, can have the same instructional goals. Remember, if you're using the same unit, but you're starting from one end versus another, you end up at the end covering the same material. It's a question of entry points. So it looks like this. Imagine um, this were a class. I could have the same goals of instruction, engaging with the reading and completing an authentic task, using level-appropriate vocabulary and grammatical constructions. And notice they both have form focus instruction, but with L2 learners, I start with it, with HL learners, I want to move to it. I want to start out with the task as an authentic text or material. Here is a chart with a lot of information. It's in your handout. And I just want to give you, I just want to go over some of it because it'll give you a clearer picture of what I'm talking about. So notice um, in, when you have macro base, let's look at reading which is what reading in Spanish, we use reading from day one because Spanish is so easy to read. I'll come back to that in a second. Notice in a macro or top-down approach, you start out with a complex text, 
Right. It may not be, you may not want to start out with uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez or Julio Cortazar, you know, to name some difficult uh, texts, right? But you can start with a newspaper story. And, you know, if, it's, if you pick the right story, if they have background information, they can probably access the story, read it, and, and get the main points fairly easy, right? Notice how it's different with L2 learners. With L2 learners, you start out by breaking it up and you go, oh, look at the title. That's what I mean by scaffolding. Look at the title. Now read the introduction. Read the conclusion. Let's look at some vocabulary that you need to know in order to get the hang of what we're talking about, right? So that's the idea, too. Talking is the same thing. Communication in an HL class should start out very much thinking with native speakers in mind. We're talking, right? Whereas with L2 learners, you generally, you know, give them a little bit. Then you add a little bit more. You add a little bit more so that eventually they're able to use language, right? So mainly um, the idea is that this is very controlled. With L2 learners, uh, um, bottom-up approaches are very controlled. You slowly build up on things. With HL learners, it starts out kind of a big picture where you can't control it as well, and then you work your way down towards the smaller items that you want your learners to pick up. Because I work with the uh, National, Heritage, um, National Heritage Resource Center at UCLA, um, I work with a lot of other languages. As a matter of fact, Spanish has a fairly small role at the, national, at the NHLRC, believe it or not, even though we are the largest group of heritage language speakers. But the reason why we have a fairly limited presence at the center is because there's no money to be uh, made with grants. There's no money, grant, very little grant money going into Spanish. The, the federal government um, likes to promote capacity in what are called the less commonly taught languages or the critical languages, right? Uh, and so a lot of the work I do involves um, helping teachers in those languages. So, so last weekend I was at University of Wisconsin in Madison and I was the expert on Southeast Asian languages. Not really. But, you know, I started out by saying I know very little about Southeast Asian languages, but I can tell you how to teach heritage language learners. But that's typically what I do, right? I work with a lot of other languages. I bring this up because we have such an advantage in Spanish. Our students can read. Now, you might say, my students can't read. Well, they may not be able to read a big text, a big complicated text, but they can sound out things. Right, and I bet you they can read at the sentence level, right? Other languages is a completely different thing. You know, most students in Arabic are not literate. Chinese presents the same problem, right? It's difficult to be literate in these languages. Other languages have a different alphabet. Some languages have two alphabets. So in Spanish, we are so lucky that they can read, um, and we should take advantage of that. All right. So what are the advantages of a macro-based approach? Well, you can see it, you know, it's more authentic, right? So it's more engaging. You can have them talking right away. You can have them debating. You can have them thinking right, right away. Um, it's also more conducive to learning. This is something I learned recently about learning, and it's from a book that I recommend if you're interested in learning, the psychology of learning, I recommend it. It's called Make It Stick. There are three authors. And the first author is Brown. If you go on Amazon, you can find it there. So there are three psychologists that specialize in learning. There is nothing to do with language learning. It's just learning in general. And much to my surprise, I learned that mass practice, I'll explain what that is, is something I do a lot in my class, is not as good as what they call interleaved practice. Mass practice, think about it. You're teaching the preterite versus the imperfect. You have this chapter, and it's one exercise after another, after another, after another on the preterite versus the imperfect. Then you finish that, and you go to the subjunctive. And then the next unit is, you know. But you, we tend to separate them. I do this a lot when teaching accents, accentuation. You know, practicamos las esdrújulas, esdrújulas, esdrújulas. Then I move to whatever, the monosyllables, whatever. I separate them. It turns out that for learning, it's better to have to mix it up. You can concentrate on one thing, right? But if you introduce other elements, it makes it much harder. 
And one thing I learned from this book is that learning should be effortful. You have to struggle as you're learning. And if you're separating things, you're not creating the conditions that will make it possible for them to use it, to use language in an authentic way. How many times have you taught accents? Then you give them a little composition and they can't put them in. That's because you've separated. You've done mass practice, but you haven't done interleave practice. So macro-based teaching lends itself to interleave practice. You can, you can still concentrate on particular areas of grammar, but you don't neglect the others. You're kind of doing everything at once with, again, one concentration, but you don't drop everything else just to look at that concentration. So what's the procedure for using a text with a macro approach? So you start out by thinking of native speakers. Right? What do native speakers do? What, what would they do with this reading or this movie or whatever? Right? Then you say, what do my learners, now you move into a little bit of L2 learner mode. You say to them, but thinking about your HL learners, what do they need to know in order to follow this reading? Because they're not really native speakers. Right? And it'll be different. HL learners are different from L2 learners. So what they, you will need to teach them will be different from what you would teach L2 learners. Right? And then with the idea of interleave practice, you go, what other things in this reading or text should I point out to my learners? So you don't do a singular focus on predators or preter imperfect. That's good. You can concentrate on something like that. But then you also want to throw in the kitchen sink, everything else. And they will get confused. One thing the book said, uh, the Make It Stick book, one thing the book said was um, interleave pra practice doesn't feel as good. To learners. They say, I'm confused, I can't do it, it's overwhelming. That's okay, because you as a teacher know that that's what leads to long-term learning, right? So you manage the, those, those feelings of, of the learners. So up next, I'm going to give you an example from my own teaching of a macro-based class, okay? And it's pure because it is 100% Macro. I start out with an authentic task and purpose. Um, students learn, then they, they learn the language they, they will need to complete that task. Okay. And where I'm going next, it's also an example of a project based class. One of the things I want to leave you with is the conviction that project based teaching is really good with HL learners. That's the next concept I'm going to move to when possible use a project-based approach. All right, now, as you listen, I'm gonna give you a description, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna to switch to another PowerPoint presentation. As you listen to this class, as you listen to the description I'm gonna give you, I want you to keep in mind what practices and strategies of PBL are illustrated in project-based learning, right? How is this project responsible to the needs? So think about differentiation, because that's an issue when we teach HL learners, right? They're all different. So it's probably one of the greatest challenges we face. How do we deal with all the different profiles and needs and skill levels that typically appear in our classroom? So I want you to think about project-based learning from the point of view of does it help you deal with the range of variety that you see in your classes? And then I want you to think about adaptations of this material. How can you use it to your particular teaching situation? Okay. Now, you're saying, I don't know what the best practices and strategies of PBL are. Well, they are here for you. So they start on uh, page two. Let me go through them very quickly with you. As you're listening to me talk, you can start to make a list, and then we're going to have a discussion about this. So one of the things you want to do is break the task into small steps, especially if the task is very complicated. You're going to break it up into tiny little tasks which come together at the end, right? When designing the steps and components of the project, carefully scaffold. So there's got to be a lot of scaffolding and, material, um, and, and recycling of materials. You want to have very clear directions. The more complicated the task is, the more the directions and the clearer they have to be. You as a teacher have to model what you do. And I use a really good model, a model of modeling, it's called the Gradual Release of Responsibility Model. Have you ever heard of it? It's fantastic, right? It goes, I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, 
I help, you do, I watch. So first pass through things, I model and you're watching. Second pass through an activity, now I'm kind of doing a little bit by going, well, how, what, what do I do with this? How do I fill this in? What, do I, what's some, you know, what are some words that come up here? Third pass, the students are now working and I'm circling, trying to help them. Final pass, they're presenting to me and I'm quiet and I'm assessing them. Okay, so that's the gradual release of responsibility model. Um, you provide ample practice for opportunity, uh, um, ample opportunities to practice what whatever task you want them to do. You co-construct grading groups. Have you ever done that? That's a really good activity. One year, I, I taught a class where we use um, a book by Jorge Ramos that was, and he's a fantastic writer. And what we did was we looked at many essays that he had written, they're different essays, some were more like narratives, other were newspaper um, type of columns, but we, they had to write a kind of essay for each type he has in this book. And what we did was we read it, and then in class we say, well, how does he present the topic? How does he move from one idea to another? How does he present supporting evidence? How does he conclude? So we broke it up and we created, on the basis of that conversation, we created a grading rubric. And that's the one we use. But students had a really good understanding of what was to be expected of them because they created the grading rubric, right? Um, provide multiple sources of feedback and you have to monitor students' progress very closely. Another thing you want to consider, so you can think of the other things I just presented as defining traits. These are characteristics. In other words, they should be there, but they won't always be there where students present their work to an audience. And if it involves publishing, it's all the better. Nowadays, we've got so many opportunities to publish that it, it's fantastic to have this kind of thing. You want to also think about real, doing real things for real life purposes when you construct tasks or activities. You want to think about developing collaborative skills, the kind of things we associate with 21st century skills. And technology should be, if possible, an essential component, right? And finally, here's some things that are specific to HL learners. Give them a choice. After all, they're a little bit like native speakers. And don't you guys like to get a choice, right? You don't have to get, you know, control that so tightly. Um, and then this is, um, Olga Kagan has come up with these five principles. The idea behind the five principles is very simple. Go from what they know to what they don't know. Don't start out with what they don't know. So if they know, if they, they speak well, use a speaking to move to writing, let's say. If they understand everything they hear, move from the hearing to move to reading. So you, you might hear a story in the news, you might hear a story in the newscast, and then you might follow up with a newspaper story where they read it. That's what she means by the from to principles. And notice that you want to build on their motivations. And we've already seen from that little clip that I read to you from my student what their motivations are. They want to deal with issues of identity. They want to deal with, they want to be with people who had to, have had to go through the same things, etc. So now, let me show you my class. It's Spanish 250. It's, um, it's college level, now it's called intermediate. And remember I told you I work a lot with um, teachers in other languages. In many other languages, this would be a super advanced class. It's good to keep that in perspective because you know we're so used, especially in a place like Texas or in California or Miami, the level is so high that we tend to focus on what they don't know and, and we don't realize just how much they know. So only in Spanish would this be called intermediate. When I show this to other languages, they go, no way. Spanish 250 is learner-centered. Remember, this is one of the things I want you to think about. In what way is this learner-centered? How do I differentiate instruction? Another thing is, I'm not up there teaching. I'm not doing what I'm doing here right now. I'm not doing a lot of talking, right? I'm a coach, and I'll show you what I mean. It's skills-focused, not knowledge-focused. So I, I grade them on what they're able to do, not on what they're able to tell me about language. And, um, and it's performance-based. You think you can't do it? I don't care. As long as you perform for me, I'm fine. So I don't speak a word of Russian, 
But if I, if I just say I was in a class and the, the performance was to give a poem in Russian and I managed to do it after a whole semester of practicing, that's good enough for me. That's sort of an extreme idea, but that's what I'm talking about. Of course, it's not like that for Spanish. They, they, they have knowledge too, but um, that's the idea. The way it works is they're going to use the target language, Spanish, to learn about their field of study or intended career. They're going to use their intended career, what they know about their field of study or intended career, to learn about the HL. So it goes back and forth. It's a two-way uh, street. Um, they are going to take, what they're going to learn is the language they need to take advantage of Spanish in a professional field. And they're also going to learn general academic skills. Let's see how that works. There are four steps. Do you guys teach large classes? If you don't, you're very lucky. Because in Spanish, in my experience, you know, I have 40. OK? So um, the way it works is the first week, I form the groups. Now, I like to have groups of three. So let's say it was the three of you that are going to do it. <laughs> you knew it was going to happen, that are going to do um, a presentation. You know, and typically when I talk, like I'll move up there. And now I'm really constrained here. So um, I'll say, you guys, at the, end, at the end of the midpoint of a semester, three quarters of the way through a semester, you're going to make a presentation about a topic related to your major or career choice. And they go, oh, well, <laughs> we have very different topics. I'm interested in policy, health policy. I want to be a doctor. And I am interested in administration. So I go, oh, I think you can find something there. And I have them work on something. And I tell them, it can't be three separate presentations. There's got to be a common thread running through all of them. And it can't be three similar, exactly similar presentations, because who wants to listen to the same thing three times? So you, interested in health policy, have to figure out how to connect to the doctor and how to connect to the administrator and vice versa. So notice that's where academic skills come in, right? They're thinking about a topic and a presentation that will make sense for them. First, we spent, and I'll go into this in detail, there's a period of silent reading. And if you know about Krashen's research, Stephen Krashen's research, you want a period of silent reading. All right? There is a period where they create a glossary, oops, um, where they create a glossary of terms and expressions. Then they make a presentation to the class. And then the final part, the last three weeks of a the semester, they prepare a CV, a cover letter, and take part in mock interviews. So you can see these are not entirely authentic tasks, but pretty close to authentic. And they have a real life purpose. And they connect Spanish to a larger goal. Right. So let's look at what happens with reading. All right. So we, I have my three students. Each of you is going to find seven readings on the topic. So let's say you're the administ no, you were the administrator. You're the administrator. You're going to find seven readings on hospital administration. You're the doctor. You're going to find seven readings that have to do with being a doctor. But now, remember, you're doing it in the context of having a hospital administrator. So it's going to have to relate, be, relate somehow to that. You were the policy person, <laughs> I forget. So you have to find your seven readings, right? And now each one of you is going to annotate that reading. And I'm going to make a parenthesis here, because when I first started doing this, what would happen, some people would turn in a reading that was all yellow. OK? So we have one day when I say, OK, find one reading. That's what we do in task, in class that day. I want you to find, each of you find one reading, and you turn that reading in to me annotated. What would I get? I would get people, Claudia, it's you this time, <laughs> who would highlight absolutely everything. And you go, well, what's the good of that, right? Then I would get my administrator. You know what he would do? What he would do is he would kind of circle words that, had really, that were interesting. Maybe he didn't know the words, but had nothing to do with the larger goal where I tell him, remember, you've got to be able to make a presentation. And eventually, you're going to write a cover letter and have a mock interview. You better be looking out for those words that are essential to that larger purpose, right? So the first day, I have them practice. Are you keeping track of the best practices in project-based learning? First day, they turn in one article like that. I take it home, and I go, uh-oh. Next time, before the start of class, I'm going to bring up those problems that have come up. So that then, as they're collecting readings, they won't make the same mistakes. I also model 
I take a, an article, I put it up on the screen, and I go, I go, okay, what's wrong with this? I model bad behavior in annotating articles, and I model good behavior, and we start to deconstruct the elements of good annotation, right? All right, so then another thing is we do is create word clouds. This is what a word cloud looks like. Um, are you familiar? There are sites that create these, but it's very useful from the point of view of picking out the essential words because many of them don't necessarily know how to do this. This is a word cloud that was created for a project I'm going to show you after this presentation. Now, the group, so here's my group. This is part one of the project. Now I have, I'm going to have my, I am going to have Claudia be the supervisor for this group. What she does is she collects their readings and she makes sure they're all compliant that they all have seven readings, that they're all annotated, that each reading has a word cloud, right? That they've all started to coordinate a list of ten top, top 10 concepts and vocabulary that they're going to apply to their presentation and to their glossary. Now, Claudia checks off my rubric, and she says, here's my group. We're ready to turn this in. All right. Now, we move to step two, the glossary. The glossary is not a simple glossary. First of all, it consists of 50 essential, 50 to 60 essential vocabulary items. And remember, they're not just pulled out of a hat. They are items that they're going to need to make their presentations, to make their, their, their interviews, whatever, the, the, all the other things that are coming up. And the contents of each entry is quite elaborate. Definition, well, you expect that. The English equivalent, you expect that. Five phrases, real life phrases that use these words. Not made up phrases by them, but are you familiar with the Brigham Young University corpus? It's fantastic. It's free. You do have to register, but it's fantastic. So let's say I'm going to show you an entry in a second where the word was thermodynamica because I had engineers present it. They go to the Brigham Young corpus, they type in thermodynamica, and out will pop maybe thousands of real life sentences from papers, newspaper articles, etc., that use that word. So, what they have to do for me is turn in copy by hand. They're going to copy it by hand. In, during those three weeks, they're turning in, in little bits and pieces. One of those bits and pieces is to copy it by hand. I want them copying it by hand because if they copy and paste, they're not learning the experience of seeing the word in writing and, and all that other stuff, right? So they pick up five phrases that use the word. Now you see that they start to use the word in context, right? The five most commonly used words with the term, what I call collocational restrictions, right? So when you talk about your family, you can't just know that familia is family. If you're going to talk about family, you have to know the words that you use to support familia. ¿Verdad? Hermanos, hermanas, hogar, padres, ¿verdad? Vida, compartir, no sé, right? whatever, whatever comes up. So the Brigham Young University corpus will give you that too. So if your word is thermodynamics, you type it in and you say, give me the five most common words that appear with this word, and it'll tell you. So you're learning words in a cluster. And then they have to give me two items with the same root. So for fam family, it would be familiar. Oh, familiar, familial, familismo in Spanish, whatever. So this is what a glossary looks like for my engineers. And I'm going to show you my, my engineer's presentation when I'm done with this. And then we'll take a break and come back and discuss the elements of, of this. This is what it looks like. You can see everything is there. They're t they turned it into me once already in writing by hand, which they copy. And I make it, and I look it over. Typically, they make mistakes about spelling or accents. And that gives me the opportunity to say, hey, did you notice that you copied, you wrote había without an accent? There was an accent there in the original, but you forgot to put the accent in. When they turn in the glossary, however, it's all uh, copied and pasted. Right? So now, what happens? Now, Claudia has already been the leader for the group. Now I'm going to have Lily be the, group, the leader for this part of the project. And Lily, what you're going to make sure is that, so there are 50 to 60 terms, that everybody's done an equal number of terms, that every definition, every glossary entry has all the elements of the glossary entry, 
that they're all in alphabetical order, that there are no repeats. Sometimes I get students doing the same thing. They haven't even bothered to coordinate things. That they're good terms, terms that they're actually going to have to know. And then once you have that already, you turn it in to me. I give you a grade for being the group leader for this part of the project. I gave you a grade for being a group leader for that part of the project. Here comes part three of the project. You have to prepare a presentation. Notice, by the way, this is all building on everything else. So you first read about it. Then you figured out what words you needed to know. Then you got your presentation. When it gets to this point, they're, pretty, they're feeling very confident. Remember? The first day I introduced this, I cancel class. I know some of you can't do that. But what I do is I schedule appointments in my office. You can do this in your class. You just put them to work in groups. And I say, OK, you guys think you have your presentation ready? Start talking to me about it. Inevitably, what happens is they start to talk and they break down. They get stuck. Ay, no sé cómo se dice, cómo es tal cosa. Momento, por favor. And I say, you know, where you break down, that's where you need vocabulary. So we, we learn to the value of breaking down, of practicing. Again, for the presentation, I give them very clear guidelines. It has to be well organized and coordinated. And how do we know what's well organized and coordinated? I model a good presentation and a bad presentation. I model a presentation where I read everything off the PowerPoint. And then I say, did you like it? And then, what's wrong? I was kind of boring when you went, OK, so you don't want to be doing that, right? Um, and so you know, I modeled well-organized ones and poorly organized one. Uses appropriate language. Again, no breakdowns. Because at that point, they've been working for nine weeks. At that point, nine to 10 weeks, they should already have the, the, the words. And everything, they've had a lot of time to practice. That's another thing. So it's a performance. I scare the, di the living daylights out of them. I say, you better be perfect. Go on, watch a TED Talk. That's the quality I want you to give me, right? Um, I tell them how they have to dress. No skimpy little outfits for the girls. No messy outfits for the boys. They're giving a professional presentation. I scare them, but you know it works. They come in with wonderful, wonderful presentations. I'll talk about it in a second. Another thing is the level has to be appropriate. If it's a very technical topic, they have to figure out how to make it less technical. It's, if it's a very familiar topic, they have to figure out how to make it interesting, right? So I've had students talk about um, how to discipline children. You know, we've all been disciplined, and those of us who have children have had to discipline, right? So you've got to figure out something to say that will be new and interesting to the audience, right? And then they have to turn in. One day, they turn in the title slide and the overview slide. I grade them, and I come back, and I say, oh, I noticed some people when they were doing this, they got this or that part wrong. The next day, they turn in the vocabulary slide and the conclusion. And I, I, men I um, break it up in class, and I, I tell them what was right and what was wrong. What do I mean by vocabulary? Vocabulary becomes very interesting. Because think about it. A word like thermodynamica, remember I showed you the entry from thermodynamica? You can kind of tell that's thermodynamics. So it's a cognate. The problem that thermodynamica presents is, does anybody know what thermodynamica is? I didn't. I mean, I know thermo is heat, but I don't really know what thermo is. So the problem with that word has to do with not knowing the concept. So my engineers, when they do a presentation, they have to explain the concept. Other words, you know the concept, but you don't know the word. So there, you have to explain the word. So this is part of the process when they're preparing their presentation. They talk about how do we deal with the different words that we have to present, right? And, and this is part of the critical skills, academic skills that they're picking up. Each student prepares a five-minute presentation. And the group, and now, who's the remaining one? My administrator. My administrator is now in charge of making sure that all the presentations are coordinated, that there are no mistakes with the presentations, that it, it fulfills all the requirements that we, you know, we had. He keeps timing you know, to make sure everybody is exactly, you know, talks for exactly five minutes. He's in charge. And he gets a grade for that portion of the work. So notice, everybody has taken a turn in being a, a coordinator of the activity. OK. At this point, I want to talk about some of the topics. First of all, I want to start out with a very candid admission. I started doing this because I was really bored 
using my textbook. I used, I used to use my textbook, si se puede, every single semester. I didn't want to read those readings anymore. I'm also getting old, and I didn't want to be on my feet. I have to be honest. I just didn't want to be on my feet that many hours. So I thought, I'm just going to create this project-based thing because it'll give me a little break. It'll introduce some variety in my teaching. You know, if it doesn't work out, I'll go back to doing it the old way. Well, it's more than worked out. I can't tell you how much I love doing it this way. A couple of things. They're doing the work, not me, but it's good. It's good kind of work, right? And then another thing is that it's so damn interesting. So, for example, I had um, my hospital group talk about what they did. They get very creative. They presented their particular fields, but the theme, the topic was the evolution of surgery. So they went back to how the Greeks did surgery. You know, how, you know, and then they, they went, and then they moved, you know, they moved through the ages and eventually they projected to the future what's coming. Can you imagine how interesting that is? And then the policy person talked about, well, what does this mean in terms of how do we finance all these very expensive things that are coming up? And the hospital administrator talked about what does this mean in terms of the people we have to hire? And the doctor turned, talked about in terms of training, what's up ahead? It became a fascinating topic to the point that at the end of 15 minutes, I said, folks, time's up. The class rebelled against me and said, no, let them keep going. That's how interesting it was. And that's what happens. During the presentation period, every single night, I come home and I go, you're not going to believe what I learned. I had business majors once present the drug cartels, how drug, the, the business side of the drug cartel. So they taught us principles of business management and business, business organization, but they use drug cartels to illustrate how these are implemented. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. So that's the advantage. You're going to love what your students are doing. You're going to be riveted. It's not going to be the same old boring reading you keep doing. Okay. So now let's get to step four. Now for this step, they're going to, they're going to create a CV, a cover letter, and they're going to take part in a mock interview. The nice thing about a CV is that the words are already exist out there. The phrases already exist, right? So if I say experience in my CV, you know, go, that's plagiarism. That's just what you put down in your CV, right? That's what I tell them. What you're going to do, they, they create a bank of CVs, they're going to read them, and they go, oh, I can use this term, and they learn the terms that they're going to use for their CV. They copy good CVs, adapting them to their own purpose, right? Same thing with a cover letter. Think about it. When you write a letter, a, a formal letter, it's mostly those phrases exist. You're just kind of copying them and adapting them. So we read a lot of cover letters, and on the basis of that, they prepare their own cover letter. Again, this is part of modeling. Because nobody's born knowing how to write a cover letter or a CV. Those are very formulaic things. So they learn that in order to do those formulaic things in language, they have to look at a lot of existing um, things, models out there. And this is another t place in which Spanish has a huge advantage. When I give this presentation to Arabic speakers, they go, oh, we don't have this. This doesn't exist. We have this in ample quantities. So they have to do, at the very end, they have to do a job, mock, job uh, mock interviews. Do some of you do that? It's a really good exercise. And I learned that from my daughter's um, high school Spanish teacher. It's a great exercise. But, but we go online, and it turns out there are a lot of sites out there where they can actually see job interviews completely in Spanish, and somebody will critique them and say, well, you didn't answer that question well, or notice how, you know, they'll say, notice how the person had a lag in a few years, a gap in working, and notice how the person answered that question. So they deconstruct the interview and give you tips, 100% in Spanish. So what do I do? I give them 50 questions, and I say, for your mock interview, you get to pick two of these questions. Your interviewers, who are classmates, three interviewers, will pick three questions, and I will pick two questions. In other words, they have to prepare. They will be asked seven questions. Of course, they're going to have to prepare. They better prepare all 50, right? So then the day of the interview, which is the very last week of the semester, each one does, takes part, uh, is interviewed and interviews um, uh, another student. They dress up. 
I tell them you have to mimic the conditions exactly as if you were doing it. You must not be uh, uh, hesitating, right? You're going to be asked, for example, about your lack of experience because you're a student who's born with experience, job experience if you're a student. Come up with an answer, right? You might be asked, you know, how does the job relate to what you study? And it may not be so closely related. You better come in with an answer to all of those questions. The time to think of the answer is not the day you're being interviewed, but ahead of time. So part of the work that takes place during those three weeks when they're preparing all of this is anticipating questions and possible good answers and the language they need in order to give those possible good answers. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the product. So these are my engineering students. And speaking of uh, copyright and permission, I got permission from them in writing for to show this. Yes, propósito y organización. You'll see their mistakes, it's not perfect. But it's pretty, pretty good, you'll see. Okay, so there are three engineers. This was an easy group to make. They're in different branches of engineering, but um, they're all engineers, right? So what is it? like a mechanical engineer? They talked about all of this. Um, I don't even remember. I'm gonna go through quickly, but you can see these are applications, right? Uh, electrical engineering, how it relates to other fields of engineering. They brought these little coils and showed us, I can't tell you anymore what it meant, but they explained why, uh, why they use them, applications, all these things. Um, then this is a woman, she's a chemical engineer, and um, she also does environmental. Okay, so then what they did was they, they had a choice and they moved to the idea of what about Hispanics in engineering, which is an important question. Remember, in the STEMs, we're trying to get more minority students in the STEM fields. And, and so they researched this. Look at the kind of research that, that went into it and they presented it to the class, right? Then they looked at organizations that can help them. Oh no, this is what they need to do in elementary and secondary school to prepare for a career in engineering organizations that they can access, uh, extra courses. You can see, you know, pretty impressive. You know, and this is her CV. It's still in English because they they she hasn't gotten to the CV part in, in Spanish. Projected earnings, all in Spanish because this exists in Spanish. doesn't exist in the other languages, but we're so lucky to have it in Spanish. Right Now, notice what they did. This is an excellent presentation, but you know, with every presentation I learned something. Look at that first line as part of the conclusion. Ingeniería es difícil. I wish I had anticipated that this would be a problem. This is the kind of thing that I will model. I'll say, I'll bring it up and I'll say, but typically ahead of time, by the time they present it, it's too late. I used it for the next semester. I said, is that a good line? It's kind of a throwaway line. Do you guys do, I do that a lot. When I have a paper and I'm tired, at the end, I just kind of throw away, you know, just throw something, put something out there because I'm tired. That's what they did. The presentation was not about engineering being hard. The presentation was really interesting, right? But, um, but that's how they closed it, right? So we talk about what is a good conclusion, and we practice that. So now let's go back to the questions I asked you. What did you see in the way of best practices, differentiation, and we'll get to the next question in a second. So what do you see? What did you see in the in the way of project-based strategies and principles? But it's not so you can use your handout, right? What did you notice that I did? Yeah. It's authentic, real life, right? Right? And it serves a purpose, because you can imagine in college they're already thinking about that next step, finding a job. Oh, and I should point out that my engineers, I was so impressed with my engineers that I called the EOP office in our university and I said, you know, I have these students that gave a fantastic uh, presentation on Latinos in the STEMs. And they said, well, bring them over. They went over, they gave the presentation in English. They said they could do it in Spanish and I could vouch for them being able to do it in Spanish. Guess what? They went on tour hired by the university to local high schools to give this presentation. That's how authentic the task was. Right? What else did you see in the way of strategies? Small steps, right? And those, each of those small steps were modeled, right? And they, get, they got feedback, right? So for the readings, they turn in one reading, and I said, you didn't annotate it right. 
for the um, glossary, I didn't say this, but one day they would turn in one glossary entry. And I would say, oh, this is not so good. Notice, you know, whatever. So each step of the way, they're getting a lot of feedback be before they turn in the large piece. What else did you notice? They're in charge of their own learning, and they choose. They, they have a choice as to what they do, right? Exactly. So they had a real audience, right? It wasn't some yeah. textbook-generated audience. Students receive clear and detailed directions. Okay, rationale. So remember, you're going to have to do a presentation. You're going to have to do an interview. This is a larger purpose. This is why we're doing it, right? Second, the project is broken down into small steps. Somebody mentioned that. The different components are modeled, okay? Uh, they practice the different components. Technology is an essential part of it. You want to have technology because students like to work with technology, right? Did you see, I did the gradual release of responsibility. I do a presentation, they watch, right? I do a presentation, then they tell me how to improve on it. They do a presentation when I'm walking around, they're working in groups, and I'm walking around and I'm listening, and I go, no, let me help you with that. And then the final product, they're doing their presentation, and I'm just watching and giving them a grade, right? Notice I also use the from two principles. They read to inform their writing, which was the glossary. And they read to inform their speaking, which was the presentation, right? And they spoke, this is the presentation they did in class, to inform their writing, which was the cover letter that they prepared and the PowerPoint presentation they prepared. Let me get to differentiation. What did you notice? Is this project somewhat differentiated? Exactly. So it's by interest. That's one way you want to differentiate instruction. You want to give students some choice. Yeah. Notice also that I'm walking around, right? So if I hear you're making a mistake, I'm not bringing up the mistake for everybody. I'm just saying, you know, Clara, you might want to consider when you wrote the title slide, you put every word in capital letters in Spanish. We don't do that. It's just the first word, you know. And other things that come up, more grammar-related things, we're going to talk about grammar later, right? We're going to spend a long time talking about grammar, how you do grammar in a project-based, macro-based um, uh, framework, right? But that's how it's differentiated. The project also has something that I don't have time to explain, but I, I will briefly mention. It's an, it's, it's, there's an agenda. By agenda, I mean there's a list of items. The students know that they're going to have to complete this list of items. How does an agenda differentiate instruction? By differentiating pacing. Students who need extra help and a little bit of extra time can get it if they know what's coming ahead and they can pace themselves. Notice the project has an agenda because there are all these four distinct phases and they know ahead of time what they're going to have to produce. So that helps the struggling learners get access to me or to other people for resources. It also, um, the technology functions as um, a learning center. They can access information as they need it. In a differentiated classroom, you want to vary process. Process is how you acquire mastery of the material. And some learners don't need very much in the way of process. They get it right away. Others need a lot of instruction. So while we're on a break, I want you to think about your situation. How can you adapt it? This is different, notice, because this is a whole semester's worth of projects. And these are college students, and it's a fairly advanced level. So think about what kinds of adaptations you might have to make by educational levels, context, et cetera. The product is what they turn in to demonstrate mastery of the material. The process is what they do to gain mastery of the material. Remember my, my story about driving to the mountains, what I had to do. And pacing is how quickly you work your way through it. So those are the three ma main elements of differentiation. You want to have some differentiation of pacing, some differentiation of process, some differentiation of product. Differentiating product is a little bit tricky because a student can come at the college level in particular. They can come and say, hey, why do I have to do this? But he has to do that. So I never differentiate product because of those. Maybe in your situation it's not dangerous. But for me, it would be. They all have to get to the same end point. They have to do different things. I heard, so that's really nice the way you, you notice that the, L, the heritage language learners need help with the writing. The L2 learners need vocabulary. I would just throw in a small suggestion. You want to set it up so that they can help each other. 
because the L2 learners typically, I don't know about your particular grade level, but typically know something about writing. They're better at writing than the HL learners. So they might be able to help. I know why you're going like this, because if you just put them together, and I'm going to talk about this next, if you just throw them together and you say, help each other, as my, my, my son said, my son was taking a Russian class, and there were some heritage speakers, and I asked them about that experience, because they know nothing. They, they can't help you. They're good for nothing. So if you just throw them together, you're right, they can't help. You have to set it up very carefully, and I'm going to move to that uh, later on, okay? But you're doing the right thing. You are differentiating, and you're right. Those are the hardest classes. Right? Okay, that's a really good point and question. When there's a sequence, you cannot, you don't have the luxury of doing this. As it turns out, the sequence course for, for this one is a writing course. And so this works well from the point of view of sequencing to an HL writing course. Now, if you have Spanish 101 or whatever it is, you know, or, or maybe not 101, not the first level, but maybe you, you find them in the second or third level course, you've got a sequence to the next one. You don't do them a favor if you go off the map, right? If you go off script and you teach them all this stuff and they get to the next level and they can't perform at the next level. Excellent. And you know, you said something very significant. So you have a theme, La Virgen de Guadalupe is what I, right? That's what you said. Notice you can do macro-based teaching and project-based teaching lends itself to genre-based teaching. By genres, you can explore La Virgen de Guadalupe, you can watch a movie, you can read a story, you can read a new story, you know, a short story, you can read a poem, you can do art. So you're visiting the same topic using different genres. The great advantage of that is that they have the concepts. So they're really mostly focusing on learning language, even though as they're developing more concepts, if you keep revisiting the same topic using a different genre, you're recycling the, the vocabulary, but you're also getting a sense of genre, how language varies by genre, which is something that they need to learn as, as part of becoming educated heritage speakers. A key element of differentiation and project-based learner agency. Eventually, they figure out what to do. You know, I always, when I, I give a week-long seminar on differentiation, and I always say, the, you know, think about getting on an airplane, how complicated that is, all the things that have to happen. The reason why it works, and it works fairly smoothly, although I understand lately there have been problems, it's because everybody knows, you know, when you travel, you have your pocket, you got your document in here, you take your shoes off, you, got, you know, there's a, a woman with a small kid, you help out so that everybody kind of moves along. That's how you want your classroom to function. If you say center work, everybody knows what you mean by center work. An exit card, I'll, I'll show you what an exit card is at the end, everybody knows what you're doing. So you want to work towards learner agency and independence. Excellent. All right, so let me give you some of the advantages. Promotes interaction and teamwork. Remember what you know, we talked about with these three. Promotes student autonomy, which is what you were talking about, autonomy and agency, critical thinking. It works working towards some meaningful real goal, which is what you had mentioned. This is an authentic activity. You mentioned it too. Balances the relationship between macro-based, authentic, and language learning. Remember how they're picking all the vocabulary they're learning, right? is learner-centered. Notice ev students have a choice about topics. And as I'm working as a coach, I'm working my way through each student, giving feedback that is specific to the needs of each student. Now, there is a very serious potential problem when you're working in groups that I'm sure I don't need to uh, tell you this, but it gives me the opportunity to show you this, which I think is hilarious. When I die, I want the people I, I did group projects with to lower me into my grave so they can let me down one last time. This is a problem that comes up with projects, right? So you have to be aware of this. And I've made many mistakes, but most of all, I have to anticipate the problems. Do you remember when I was working with these three, some of the things I did to make sure everybody's doing something? Do you remember, what, what, what was the, I switched leaders, they each had a leadership role, right? So that's really important, and they got a grade for doing each of their leadership roles, right? Then, so um, one thing we do at the beginning of the semester is we anticipate, we, I, come, I have these little cards with scenarios, and I say, what happens if you have that person who doesn't want to do work, what do you do? My poor daughter recently had a project where she said, the teacher said, deal with it. Don't come to me, figure it out. That's not fair. Students don't know how to deal with it. So you have to lay out scenarios and you have to pre-agree 
as to how you're going to deal in those different scenarios. You give a group grade and an individual grade. Just to give you an example, for the reading, the articles, the annotated articles that they have to turn in, there's a group grade, which is a small percentage of the group grade, which is how coordinated are the articles? Do I see a thread running through them, a common thread that will enable them to build a common uh, presentation? So that'll be, let's say, two points. I can't remember right now. Let's say the whole thing is worth 10 points. The rest of the eight points are individual grades, right? So you don't just give one grade for everybody. And finally, I have to be monitoring each student's progress very carefully. So if I know that there's somebody that's not working hard, I'm on them to make sure that they keep up and they don't let their uh, group down. Other uses, do you, this is more for the college level, independent studies. Does anybody? This is a good way to do an independent study, right? For service learning, right? Now, sometimes at the high school level, I've heard of this happening, where there's a native speaker that will come in, newly arrived person from, let's say, Mexico, and that person gets put into Spanish second or third year, right? You have no choice. You have to take that student. Your principal sends that student. I mean, that, that person shouldn't be there. Right? So I don't make that, actually I've had this happen to me, I had a native speaker once in, in that class. I mean like somebody who had, had university level preparation in Spanish in my class, come on. So what I did was I gave her something that's called a contract. A contract is this kind of thing. You're going to do all this prearranged work and report to me, report to me at regular intervals. They go off and they work. Why keep them in the class? Right? So you can use your native, if you have those kind of situations, you can have your native speakers, remember, if you're not done until about age 18, and even beyond that, you're still learning vocabulary. What you can have is your native speaker develop professional level Spanish in a field of study. They can keep on studying great appropriate literacy skills in your class. So those are the references. Let me move now back to the other presentation. Okay, so I said I was going to give you an adaptation, a way to adapt or incorporate some of these ideas. That's the, what we're moving to next. Anchoring activities. Remember I mentioned anchoring activity? An anchoring activity is like a little mini project that you work on throughout the year or um, the semester, whatever the term is that you want. It works like an agenda. An agenda is a to-do list. And you want an agenda because sometimes in mixed classes, what you want to be able to do is separate the class into two and say, I'm going to work with this group. These are my L2 learners, just to give an example. I have to work with my L2 learners on something that my HL learners don't need to hear. So I need to have my HL learners doing something constructive Right? And I don't mean Facebook. I mean something really constructive while I'm working with my L2 learners. Right? So the, this an anchoring activity or an agenda serves that purpose. I say to them, hey, I'm going to work with my L2 learners. You guys are going to work on your agenda or on your anchoring activity. And why would they want to do that? Because whatever they do in class, they don't have to do at home. So there's an incentive to work in class. All right, so what are sample, uh, and I want you to remember this because I'm going to assign something to you. Silent reading, do you ever say to them, hey, by the end of a semester, you need to have read, Some, one semester I did this where they needed to have read, um, I can't remember, two novels or two books, and they're doing silent reading and they're writing down what they're reading, and they're turning their, their reading logs. Uh, journaling, a long-term project. Okay, so I, as I just said, it's a way to use a macro approach in class without doing this thing that I do where it runs throughout the semester. It's like an ancillary, a parallel activity. And to your point that you have to be aware of articulation between courses and you have to be sure that they're prepared for the next level, it's a way to introduce project in a class where you're still keeping up with the articulation, with all the courses, with the curriculum that your program has given you. So this is a good way to think about spin text, right, those stories, because you can include them as part of an anchoring activity. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do next. We're going to listen to two. We're going to listen to two of them because they're very nice and short. And see, I want you to brainstorm and get creative. Think about an anchoring activity. First of all, everybody clear on what an anchoring activity is? Okay, you're going to think about an anchoring activity for your level. And remember all the PBL concepts we talk about, modeling, clear directions, break it up into small steps, uh, the, the gradual release of responsibility uh, model, the from two principles. Keep all of those. That's a lot to keep up there, right? But think about just 
you know, think about how you might incorporate one or two. I said three, and I'd be too ambitious. All right. So let's start with this one. The Biden's. En Estados Unidos. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Sí, siempre, o sea, nos dan vacaciones y mi familia y yo, con, con la familia que tenemos en Brownsville, todos los años nos juntamos en la, tipo en las vacaciones y mi tía es la que nos cocina el pavo y siempre nos juntamos y, y yo creo que es cuando, o sea, toda mi familia celebramos Thanksgiving y comemos el pavo y damos las gracias y definitivamente, o sea, lo celebramos todos los años. ¿Y qué tal algún tipo de día festivo? Este, por ejemplo, la Navidad, ¿crees que sea muy diferente el, como lo celebras tú a cómo se celebra en este país? Sí, porque cuando celebro la Navidad con mi familia en Matamoros, pedimos posada, le pegamos a la piñata, este, hasta, des, o sea, después de la Navidad, bueno, pues cortamos la rosca de reyes, no sé si es, aquí no creo que sea. No creo que mucha gente en, no, en este país. No, este, pues. cortamos la rosca de reyes, pero hacemos muchas tradiciones como, o sea, este, pues lo mismo, o sea, pedimos posada con las velas y luego, este, y le pegamos a la piñata y siento que eso es como que lo más, o sea, la tradición mexicana que se hace, que sea diferente a esto. Okay, let's go to the next one. ¿Qué hace tu familia para, o, o de qué manera hace tu familia para mantener tus tradiciones salvadoreñas Bueno, nosotros, vivas? bueno, mi mamá cocina comida salvadoreña mucho. Ella hace pupusas, hace tamales de lote. Claro que no tan, no todas las veces, pero los hace de vez en cuando. Y lo que, lo más importante es que nos hace es que nos llevan a Salvador para ver la vida que está allá, para ver cómo de difícil está allá y la diferencia entre aquí los Estados Unidos. Y también nos mantenemos entre... Mis papás tienen un acento súper, súper fuerte. No, no hay manera de dejar la cultura salvadoreña, especialmente con, entre todos mis tíos y todos. Cuando nos reunimos, es como que si estuviéramos en El Salvador. Todos nos ponemos felices, la bulla que hacemos, la cultura nunca se deja. Oye, y este, bueno, y hablando de eso también, ¿tienes familia aparte de tus padres aquí? Oh, en sí, la mayoría de mi familia está aquí. Casi todos están aquí. Tengo varios tíos, tías que están aquí con las familias, con los hijos. ¿Y también en Texas o en otros lugares? En, ¿no? La mayoría está en Texas. Casi todos están en Houston, especialmente. Están casi todos ahí. Creo que tal vez unos primos de mi papá están, creo, como en Washington, pero la familia... Así mis tíos y tías están aquí. Tengo unos, tengo como dos tías que están en El Salvador. Y eso es todo. Y después mi abuela. Bueno, y unos primos. Bueno, y hablando. De... So now, so remember what I asked you to do. You're going to create, you can use both of them. You can use one of them. But think about one anchoring activity. Remember, we're not talking about a semester long project. One activity that students can be doing alongside everything else that they're doing in your class, what you're already doing. So I'll give you about five minutes to talk about that and see what you can come up with. And I want you to remember this. Remember the main idea is you do real things. Projects are recontextualized, recontextualized learning of a core literacy skill from exercises in which content is learned for the sake of learning to authentic learning. Remember journaling or, or reading? It, this could be watching. It, it is a, it's a sample anchoring activity. What you can do is you can ask students, keep a journal, and I, you know maybe at the end of um, whatever, a semester, a year, whatever, maybe a year is too much, but at the end of, X number of weeks, you would ask them to complete two sex, you know, watch, however, 10 videos, and then complete two text to self connections, two text to text connections, and two text to world connections, something like that. So now they're just building this up in a notebook, and while you're working with your one group of students, they, they are doing their text to X connection. Right? So that's a way to appeal to, remember at the beginning I was talking about HL only zones, those things that bring them to the classroom that make them unlike the native speakers or the L2 learners, that's a way in a mixed class to appeal to that component of who they are and what brings them to the classroom. Um, you know, you mentioned the AP, and the AP they have to write a composition. That takes practice. That can be another way 
to use this, to write a composition based on this. It can be a compare or contrast, you know, whatever you, you know, description, whatever, you know, whatever it is that you do in your class. You remember we talked about some um, macro-based activities involved doing something useful for the community? One thing I could do is they can translate these into English, right? So you can make this material accessible to non-Spanish speakers, right? There might be school principals that don't speak Spanish but would benefit from knowing about this. So let's move on now to the last topic, teaching grammar. And, and recall from what I told you earlier, in a macro-based approach, you want to start big and think about what do the my students need to get in or, or to know in order to use this reading in the way I want them to use it, or text. All right? And also remember something else I told you. What else is there in this reading that I can just keep bringing up? In my classes, every time so I, we ha I run across something and I think, oh, they probably need to be reminded of this. I say, hey, stop for a second. Look at this word here. What do you notice about it? A ver, se escribe con H y con B larga, o B de burra. So, very brief history of grammar. So, you, there used to be a time way before, I think, anybody's, anybody's time here, where it was all grammar all the time. Where does that come from? Well, because foreign language methods emerge from the classical tradition of teaching the classical languages, Latin and, and classical Greek, right? And those languages were not spoken, so it was just a matter of grammar translation and studying the rules. Then we moved into a period, this is when I was in graduate school, where it was no grammar. We were not allowed to teach grammar. Uh, it was all communicative. We found that was not so good because we know there's a lot of research now that people, that students, HL and L2 learners both benefit from form-focused instruction. So where we are now is you want to balance, right? If you just do grammar, Students can talk about the language, but they can't speak the language. If you just do communication, they will have holes, gaps. They will not be able to progress to higher levels of accuracy. And that's what I'm going to address here. Just very briefly, the what, the why, and the how. So remember, and now I'm going to focus on another HL only zone. Again, the, the pink before, remember we did, when we talked about it, was issues of affect. What, I remember the little thing I showed you, what brings them to the classroom, uh, what are their issues that they're dealing with. Now we're going to move into HL only zone in the area of language needs and strengths and something I'm going to call, which is going to be kind of strange right now, reactivity to instruction, the learning component, which is somewhat independent of language. We'll get to these one by one. All right, so first, let's start out by comparing again. Let's start out with our comparison, focusing on the learner, native speakers, HL learners, L2 learners. Who needs what? Do native speakers need practice with pronouncing R? Typically not. What about HL learners? Think your students. OK, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing this. <laughs> OK. All right, what about L2 learners? Yes. All right, let's move on to preterent and the imperfect. Do native speakers need help with the preterent and the imperfect? Now I see people vacillating. Some people are going like this. OK. What about HL learners? What about L2 learners? OK. So I'm starting to see a lot of, <laughs> a lot of that. OK. What about home vocabulary? Do native speakers need help with home vocabulary? Not really. What about HL learners? OK. What about L2 learners? Yes. Right. And then the subjunctive. Native speakers? OK, a lot of disagreement, a lot of disagreement here. HL learners. Yes, and a, um, L2 learners. OK, let's, um, let's look at that. HL learners, in my experience, most, most HL learners don't need help with VR. But maybe, in some, of you, maybe some of you do, uh, some of yours do. But typically, with phonology, they kind of have that down, right? You know why? Because phono phonology is learned very early in life. And remember, early in life, they're at home. So they're learning, they're hearing Spanish. That's when you pick up intonation, stress, the bilabial fricatives, you know, uh, that you get in Cuba, right? So, but, but some of your students may need help, all right? Let's go to um, this area where you've both said yes to HL learners uh, needing help with the predator and the imperfect and L2 learners and yes here. Do they need the same kind of help? 
No, no, right? So can you, let's flesh this out a little more. What kind of help do HL learners need that L2 learners may not need and vice versa with regard to the predator and the imperfect, let's say? What can HL learners do? They can generally, yeah, right, right? So they can generally use it. What can they not do? Writing, right? By lava. How, how can you think, how would they write by lava? It's a very common way to write in by lava. Con B de vaca, yo le digo, ¿verdad? I don't know, was it B chica, V, whatever you call it, right? Comia, how, what will you see with comia? No accent, right? So what about some irregular forms? In particularly in the preterite, they're going to need help with those irregular forms, right? Same thing for the subjunctive. There's some things they can do already, right? But there are other things they cannot. Okay, so uh, finally, home vocabulary. What did they need help with that they may not need help with? Right, writing, right? There might be dialectal questions too, right? The words that may be used in one dialect may not be used in another. Okay, and HL learners need a lot of help. They don't know the vocabulary, you know. Notice what we've done. When we think of topics, we don't just want to think part of it and perfect, pronunciate uh, R. We want to think strategically. We want to break down the elements of language into bits and pieces. You know, we can think, are we talking about the written mode or the oral mode? Are we talking, and within that, you can also think phonology. Phonology is a different beast from morphology. For the most part, our students are pretty good with pronunciation. HL learners tend to be very good. Let me put it this way. When you hear problems with the phonology, that is indicative that there are many more problems to follow in morphology, syntax, whatever. But phonology tends to be pretty solidly in there, ingrained, because it's the kind of thing they learn very early in life, right? Morphology seems to be more problematic. And syntax, especially the interface between syntax and morphology, where it's a sentence level, but it relies to on endings you put on words. And lexicon, what kind of vocabulary do HL learners need to learn, typically? Home vocabulary? No, academic vocabulary. And, and it flips. The L2 learners need, uh, typically, home vocabulary, everyday vocabulary, whereas the HL learners need the academic vocabulary, right? So um, what about formal and formal? Typically, HL learners know informal language. Is informal language bad? No. no, you need it. You absolutely need it, right? If you only know uh, formal language, you sound very stiff. No, you're not going to be invited to any party, right? What about standard, non-standard? A lot of our HL learners will come knowing a non-standard term or a dialectal term. You want them to keep those terms, and you want to add to their knowledge, right? Explicit versus implicit knowledge. Who has the explicit, Jose was mentioning this, who has the explicit knowledge of grammar? The L2 learners. And our HL learners have implicit. They can use it. They can't really talk about it. Right? And if you think about it, if I ask you to explain the subjunctive in English, I bet you most of you can't do it. Right? But you can use it. Right? Or at least you recognize it when you hear the song, if I were a rich man, if I were a rich man. That's the subjunctive right there. Right? So, um, and then rehearse versus spontaneous language. Who's good with rehearse language? L2 learners. Right? So in a project like the one I presented to you where they have to give a presentation, you can be sure that the L2 learner is going to be better at the rehearsal part because they're more used to it. That's how they learned it. Right? They're going to be more careful. They're going to know the steps. Spontaneous, then it flips, and the HL learner. Okay, then think in terms of big ideas. This was the last concept I wanted to introduce in the long list, and I'm not going to get to it, but you always want to have the big ideas driving instruction. So this is what you want to ask yourself. What are our learners likely to know how to do? And remember the five from two principles? You want to build on what they know how to do. If they can talk in the past, if they can narrate in the past orally, use that to develop writing skills, right? What are they likely to not know how to do? And when you try to diagnose a problem, again, go back to all these, um, we'll see them in a second, you know, the oral versus the written. Am I talking standard, non-standard? Don't do something I've done many times and something that I hear teachers doing all the time. When I say to them, okay, what don't they know about the predator and perfect? They'll say, they know nothing. 
It's not true. You want to be, be a doctor, right? You want to be diagnosing it very carefully. And then you also need to ask yourself, what do they need to know how to do, right? So why, don't, why am I teaching them this? What do, what, how will this apply to whatever their needs are in the real world, in the classroom, et cetera? So with these presentations, remember, we talked about modeling a lot. Modeling is really important. That's the way you learn language. This is really good because they can watch some of these presentations and you can send them out to do an interview, right? And this serves as a very good model. So that's another way in which you can use it. All right, so now we're gonna practice preterite imperfect. We kind of did this already, but let's now be more strategic. What do they need to know about the preterite versus the imperfect? When you're teaching them, what's the big idea driving instruction? What are you thinking? Of course, it relates to your level, right? But why do we want to teach them the preterite versus the imperfect? In their everyday lives, do they need to narrate? Okay, good. What about written versus spoken when you're teaching preterite versus imperfect? So they do need to narrate when they talk around the dinner table. Now we want to move to why am, do I want to teach them to write? Why do I want to teach them? Do, I want to, do we want to teach them to write in all circumstances? Yes. Because Spanish is a, has a rich written tradition, by the way, not all languages do. Okay, if they're gonna write, what kind of writing do they need to do? Okay, so my students for their project, the project I showed you, they're gonna, they wrote, uh, remember, a cover letter? That involves using the past tense in a very formal way. Let's talk high school students or uh, middle school students. What kind of writing? Personal, right? right? So you have that need drive what you're going to teach right, and the vocabulary. You are aiming for the academic register because you have this other purpose of taking them to college. In your case, it's the purpose of communicating with educated native speakers abroad. So that will define the approach you take to teaching the preterite and the imperfect. And within the, the written, what do you think is gonna be a problem? What are the main things that are gonna be problematic? for HL learners when you're teaching preterite and imperfect, and I'm talking about writing. Accents, so the EF forms, right, the E most E M. And what else? We already said it, ABA, the ABA, which tends to be written with a corta. Uh, good, okay, now let's, what about this? Explicit versus implicit knowledge. This is a trick question. Implicit versus explicit knowledge. Do native speakers have explicit knowledge? Um, those of you that have parents or brothers and sisters that are not Spanish teachers, if you say imperfect, do they automatically know? No. Yet they're able to use it, and if they're educated, they can write. Okay? So that would lead you to think that they don't need to have explicit knowledge. But I told you it was a trick question, so you know I'm going someplace else with this. All right, so let's summarize. What we have in terms of what? Spot treat. Be very strategic as to where, how you identify the, the, what's wrong, right? Don't start from zero. That's the difference between HL learners and L2 learners, right? And you don't have to cover everything. And also um, focus on the big ideas. Why am I teaching them this? What do I want them to do? Let that drive the units, the bits, uh, of the grammar point of the vocabulary that you're teaching. Let's now move to the how. So HL explanations. I said to you, well, maybe it looks like they don't need explicit knowledge. Yes and no. I said it was a trick question. So let's look at what ex um, HL explanations look like. This comes from a wonderful book that um, sent, um, Sarah Baudry, Cynthia Duca, and Kim Potowski wrote. It's a textbook. It's very hard to find, unfortunately, because it's, they will print it. You have to order it, and they will print it for you. So um, anyway, so notice this is, kinda, this is an L2 explanation. How many times have we seen this? We're experts at this. To form the imperfect, look at the infinitive, take off the ending, and if it's in an AR verb, add aba, abas, aba, abamos, aban. If it's an ER, okay, that's an, that's an L2 explanation. We're all very familiar with that. Here's an HL explanation. If you put it in una sola vez, this is in English because I give this presentation for other Una sola vez typically is going to be preterite, especially if it sounds better up there than, if it, if it, than here. Cuando podía, right? Typically what goes after cuando podía, it's going to be imperfect. That's an HL explanation. And they can use, they can tap into their implicit knowledge of the grammar to figure out what a preterite versus an imperfect is. All right, let's practice. 
Give me an H, oh, give me first the L2 explanation for the subjunctive, the present subjunctive. Do you remember? Give me one of them for AR verbs. Or for A, hablar. Oh, give me an HL explanation for forming the present subjunctive. Tu mamá quiere que. Right. If you put it in there, it's going to be what? Subjunctive. Okay, tu mamá sabe que. If it goes in there, it's going to be indicative. Will they do that pretty well? Yes, because they know commands, right? Generally. Okay, you say depends on the um, level. All right, very good. Let's keep adding to how to talk HL. So we use, use HL explanations. Help students discover the rules of language. This works well with some activities, not so much with others. And it's based on something that's called a con constructivist grammar activity, where you want students to use their implicit knowledge to discover the rules of language. This works really well with the monosyllables. In Spanish, they can they mean one thing, they take an accent, if they mean another, they don't. It's a really boring day when you sit there and you say, see si, if si significa yes, you put an accent in, if it significa if, you don't put an accent. What do I do? I say, open your computers and look for sentences that have the word see. Si and tell me which of the two meanings, what are the two possible meanings, and then tell me which of the two possible meanings takes an accent. So now they're looking for sentences and they go, they find something like, si se puede, and they go, oh, that means, eh, um, no, that means yes, sorry, <laughs> si se puede, it means yes, you can. Then you go, oh, if it means yes, it takes an accent. And we do that with all of them. They figure it out. They use authentic sentences to figure out the answer. I don't have to tell them. And they remember it better because they figured it out. Third rule for grammar instruction is prepare HL learners for form focus instruction. How many times has this happened to you? You have a mixed class, you come in, you want to practice the past tense, which is what you taught right before. You come in and you say, hey, what did you guys do last night? The L2 learner, who's a really good student, does this and says, I studied, I had dinner, I talked to my mom. You go, excellent, three preterites, fantastic. Then you turn to the HL speaker and you go, what about you? What did you do last night? Oh, I don't know, not much. I'm always tired in the evening. I prefer to work in the morning. Not a single <laughs> past tense. And you get really annoyed because you go, I'm trying to practice the past tense and this person gives me this. By the way, I asked myself, how would I answer that question? That's exactly how I would answer the question. What did you do last night? Nothing. I was, I'm, I'm always tired. I can't do anything in the evening. But it's no fault of the HL learner. It turns out that there's a different orientation to learning, to task-based interventions between HL learners and L2 learners. And this comes from a dissertation that Julio Torres, who's a professor now at UC Irvine, uh, wrote. And he found that HL learners are oriented to the content of the task. What they do is they're trying to figure out what's the real situation and I'm going to react to it in a real way. The elder learners are in on the joke and they go, this person doesn't care about what I did last night. This person just wants to practice the unit, the, the unit lesson that we did last time, which was on the past tense. So they, they jump right in and they give you the verbs that you want them to practice, right? This is a problem. If you find yourself frequently saying, why can't they follow along? Why are they not doing what everybody else is doing? This is why. Because they have, they're oriented to the task as an authentic contact, as a real life thing. And your L2 learner is oriented towards the structure of language learning. So why does this matter? Because their orientation to content over form reduces their ability to take advantage of form focused instruction. And as you're writing the verbs on the board that they're giving you in the past, you know, I'm thinking, I'm tired, I can't do anything in the evening. I'm just, I'm not registering what's going on, right? Here's another thing, we, um, so they're looking in the wrong direction. I often think of it as, you know, when I point to my dog, you know, there's some food on the floor, and I go, there, there, look, look. And she's looking at my finger when I want her to look, right? So they're not looking where you want them to look. You have to prepare them to focus on form. And I'm going to show you that in a second. But before I do, I want to introduce this idea of disciplinary literacy. What is disciplinary literacy? Disciplinary literacy, I've been talking about preterite, imperfect, conjugations, you use the word infinitive. You guys all knew what we were talking about. 
right? Now, if we had a bunch of engineers here, would you know? Would they know? No, we'd have to stop and say, hold on, when I say Puerto, I mean this. When I say imperfect, I mean that, right? They wouldn't be able to follow. Even though, if they're native speakers, they can use the Puerto and the imperfect just fine. They just don't know the language, right? So unless I give them access to that language, they can't follow what's going on in the class. I have mixed classes in my linguistics classes. When I teach linguistics, the linguistics of the subjunctive, if they don't know um, indicative, subjunctive, subordinate clause, subject, different subjects, I have to say if there's a different change in subject, they're not following my explanation. So, so you, they need to have disciplinary literacy. Even in a class where all your learners are HL learners, and all you and you're giving HL explanations, by that I mean, remember you put it into a sentence, una sola vez, o mi mamá quiere que. Even in that class, you have to have labels because it becomes too burdensome, right? If they're making a mistake and I want to show them that the imperfect is se escribe con larga, I don't want to start to say, hablaba, bailaba, asaba, whatever. All of these, I want to say the imperfect is written con larga, right? And I'm going to say if the imperfect frequently takes an accent on the E. I don't want to have to be saying, comía, tenía, servía, leía. Become, you've got to have some labels when you're talking about things in class, because it's a shortcut. Here's another thing, and it relates to what you were saying about even if your class in your class labels don't matter, if they stay with Spanish, they're going to get to a class where labels will matter. It might be the next language class, or it might be when they get to me, my linguistics class. If they get to my linguistics class and they don't know those labels, they're going to be lost. They can't follow, you know, because I'll be explaining something and they're still back there trying to figure out which one's the imperfect and which is the preterite. So you have to teach this disciplinary literacy. And it's not just labels, but it has to do also with the routines of language learning. You know, you're doing it in a communicative way, but there's another purpose driving, typically, the, the, the task, right? You want to learn vocabulary, you want to learn uh, some kind of grammar. So you have to alert them to that because it doesn't come naturally to them. They're focusing on things as a real life activity. All right. Now, this, this connects to reactivity to instruction. This is a quote that comes from a book, that book I mentioned by Sara Baudry, Cynthia Ducat, and Kim Potowski. This is a quote from a French teacher. Notice what the French teacher says. My French foreign language students know grammar better than my heritage speaker students. On exams, they can always fill in the correct forms of the subjunctive or the imperfect, but the heritage speakers cannot. The reason why they cannot is because they don't understand that when you have that fill in the blank, you're looking for a past tense verb and you're limiting it to preter or the imperfect. You don't care about blue perfect or nothing, right? You just, so you have to give them the disciplinary literacy. And why don't they know it? Why, why is it that HL learners are so handicapped in this regard with regard to L2 learners? All right, so there's this natural orientation, but how does that form? Think about what happens in your mixed classes. The L2 learners start from day one learning these labels and learning the routine, right? I come in, I do a little activity that's kind of communicative to, to review what happened last time, then I move on to a new topic, I explain it, we do an exercise. They know this routine. So I've been doing exercise videos for a long time. Each one has a slightly different routine, but it's always the same thing. Like you do four on one side, then you move and you do four on the other side. So I kind of, even if the specific sequence is different, I kind of know the general architecture of the exercise videos, right? So your, your L2 learners are like that. They know the architecture of this class. They have disciplinary literacy. The HL learners don't because they parachute in to uh, um, um, intermediate level. Typically, they don't come in from the very beginning, they parachute in. So what happens is by then, the L2 learners have all this disciplinary literacy, but your L2 learners don't. So you have to figure out to give them this information, because if you don't, they're going to be at a disadvantage relative to, they're going to be lost, you're going to be frustrated, and they're not going to be able to benefit from instruction. Okay, so it disadvantages them in the classroom. So how do we do this? Okay, first of all, remember there's this orientation to authentic tasks, treating it as an authentic task, as opposed to treating it as an opportunity to learn something about language. So if you're in a mixed class 
and you want to teach them, if you want everybody to be on board telling you what they did last night using a past tense verb, you have to say, hey, I'm meeting with you guys right now, and here's what we're doing. You need to post signs. You got to give them a map of learning. We're, we're, we're studying the past tense, and Spanish has two types of things. And this is what you're going to need to be able to do. This is what I'm expecting for you. And when I'm talking about what you did last night, I want you to practice, pay close attention to the verbs that we're using. Right? And then, if you're going to keep using the word preterite and imperfect, you better make sure that they understand what a preterite and imperfect is. So you also give them disciplinary literacy in the way of teaching, la teaching them labels, because unless you give them labels, they can't follow what you're doing. Right? Okay. So in terms of how we deal with grammar, you spot treat grammar items, especially if you're in an HL classroom. Know, know that they're different from L2 learners. They need specific uh, focus on items of grammar, not everything as you would with L2 learners. Second, you want to focus on the big ideas. You want to ask yourself, why do I need to know this? What do I want them to do? What would they not be able to do if I didn't teach them this? And then, in terms of how, four things. Use HL explanations, right? Where that I mean explanations that build on their implicit knowledge of grammar. They don't know what an infinitive is. They might need to learn it. But the one way to teach them is, um, me encanta comer, me encanta bailar, me encanta leer. Those that you put in that phrase, those are infinitives, right? Help students discover the rules to the extent that they can. It doesn't work for all of them, but in some cases it works well. Prepare the learners to focus on form. Okay, tell them ahead of time. If you're doing an activity that looks like it's very communicative, anticipate that they're going to be looking in the wrong place. And then finally, teach disciplinary literacy. Whatever labels and routines they need to know ahead, ahead of time to follow your explanations, you have to pre-teach those. Okay, so let's put it all together and practice. So I'm gonna ask you to construct some kind of activity that follows macro-based principles and the principles of language teaching that I've just outlined. And I'll, I'll put them up for you in a second. But remember, you start out by first thinking, what do native speakers do with this? Why is this of interest? What, is, what can I do in the way of an authentic task? Then you also think, what do my native speakers need to know, my HL learners need to know in the way of grammar or vocabulary to be able to do this, to follow this activity, to engage in the task? Then what other things can I pick out as, uh, as, I'm, as we're working with this material? Because you always want to be bringing, remember the interleave thing where you want to be mixing things up. You want to be always saying, hey, by the way, I noticed. Did you notice this word? Notice how that works, right? And then step four, what language, uh, how are you going to teach a language in HL-specific ways? And remember, that, invo that involves figuring out the spots. Pre-teaching necessary grammatical terminology using HL explanations, using contrastive grammar activities, focusing students' attention on form, providing extensive practice opportunities, and pointing out whenever possible these things come up. It's a lot, okay? But we're going to practice it a little bit, and all you have to do is one. ¿Cuándo se mudó usted a los Estados Unidos? Bueno, yo me vine a ir a Estados Unidos cuando tenía 25 años, o sea que hace 24 años. Ya el próximo año va a ser la mitad de mi vida aquí, la otra mitad en Colombia. Y me vine porque Cristina, la que es ahora mi esposa, que nos conocimos cuando teníamos como 15 años, ella se vino a vivir a Estados Unidos cuando tenía 21 años y regresó, nos casamos. Vivimos allá como un año y después uh, nos mudamos aquí, vivimos a vivir a California y estuvimos como cuatro años en California y en, en 1989 nos vinimos a vivir a Texas, a la ciudad de Irving, donde todavía vivimos. ¿Y fue difícil? Mm, sí y no. Yo tuve muchísimas ventajas. En primer lugar, yo llegué aquí a este país con visa de residente, o sea, yo jamás llegué a tener problemas de, o sea, con inmigración o problemas de estar aquí indocumentado, como muchos de mis amigos. 
también en la secundaria uno tomaba en clases de inglés, pero en realidad era más que nada gramática y, claro, yo leía en libros en inglés y hasta traducía, pero cuando llegué aquí no entendía nada. O sea, también lo más difícil fue aprender el idioma, pero no, no tardé mucho tiempo, o sea, tal vez como en seis meses ya más o menos me podía comunicar. Y también tenía, digamos, buenas conexiones aquí. Desde que llegué como a los dos meses empecé a trabajar. <coughs> o sea que nunca me tocó pasar las dificultades que a otras personas, que a otras personas les ha tocado. Y, y de todas maneras, tal vez por ser de, de una familia pobre, tal vez por no tener tanta privacidad, por vivir con más dificultades, yo creo que me adapté rápido. O sea, creo que fui criado para adaptarme a cualquier circunstancia. Entonces me, me adapté rápido a la vida de aquí y pues nunca he tenido, digamos, conflictos culturales ni me he sentido extraño o, o extranjero. Para mí es como si estuviera en otro barrio de, de mi país, con otra gente. O sea, nada más me adapté a la cultura, a la gente, al idioma. O sea mm. que no, no, no ha sido difícil. So let's follow the steps. So remember, step number one is, what do native speakers, what would a native speaker do with this kind of read? So take a moment, take two minutes, and come up with a task or, or an observation that you could use to help design a task or an activity for the classroom. So, you know, that's a very natural reaction. Oh, that's interesting, you know. He came here and he knew some English and he, ha he was documented. He didn't have problems with, you know, being undocumented. That I can relate to that. Or, you know, somebody who didn't have that would say, oh my God, this person had it much easier than me. So comparing and contrasting, very good. What else would a native speaker do? Exactly. So you compare yourself, right? You do a text to self-connection, right? So, right, you're comparing yourself to what you're hearing or your friends. If, you know, all this conversation is going on about immigrants. Well, this is a person who made a good living for himself, who you can see is a kind person, a productive person, a successful person. So you can somehow do a text to world connection with that. That's what native, normal people do. Okay, so that's step one. You don't stop there because we're not just normal people. We're HL normal people. So now we move to step two. We ask ourselves, what here in the language is gonna drive, it? Why, what, what am I doing, why am I doing this? What's the language point or points that I wanna make? More. Look at the word, I see the word, I lost it, empecé. Do you see the way uh, it's like six lines up and pese? Is there anything there that you like that you could go, oh wow, I can do something with this in my HL class? Okay, el acento. But what else? When I see empecé, I salivate. What? Okay, so notice what you can do. You can say cambia la C, a la Z, you know, remember that. And that's an L2 explanation. Here's what I would do. Let me get my leash here, okay? Um, and I would say, this is what I do in my class. I say, ves, how do you write ves in the plural? Veces. Luz, how do you write luz in the plural? We, you know, we work through this, luces. Then we do empezar. How do you do empecé? And then I say to them, can you think of a generalization? Can you think of what, what, what's going on here? What aspect, remember there were four aspects to building, giving an HL explanation. What aspect is this? What am I asking them to do to discover, right? It's a constructivist activity. And notice what's really nice about this. I'm not just doing empezar, casar, vencer. I'm not just doing verbs and preter and the imperfect. What was that? Uh, correcto, correcto, almorzar, comenzar, all these. I'm also, de un viaje, taking the best, loose, all of these other ones, right? So I'm not just strictly focusing on part of the imperfect, as important as that may be, but I think, oh, I've got I've to parlay this into more, more stuff. 
And the way to I parlay it is I use what they, they know the plural. So if I just show them how to write it, then I go, okay, you guys are detectives, figure it out for me. What's the rule in Spanish? And then if other readings bring this up, other texts, I go, remember what we said? Who remembers? What was the plural of loose? What was the point there? And we just keep bringing it up time and time again. The present perfect. Do they need a lot of help into how to, like the present perfect versus the predator versus the present tense? Do they have, need, need help with that? In my experience, they don't, right? What did you say? Right. So again, you fine tune the thing that's right. It tends to be a spelling issue, especially in the present perfect, right? When you get into the subjunctive forms, there, there are other complications there. You know, they can fill out exit cards. I was going to give you an exit card. We don't have time for it. They can fill out an exit card. And they, in an exit card, an exit card is a ticket out the door where they turn something in. And you can have them choose a grammar point that they notice. Oh, I didn't know 24. But is that the number that's there? I can't see. 21. OK. I didn't know it was written like this. They can, they can find something of interest and maybe teach it or point it out to somebody else. So I say, very quickly, very good, you guys, excellent, um, excellent ideas. I just want to close with some other Topics, I know you know this. You guys did a great job um, at, at, at doing this. So we went through these steps. Um, other topics, here it is. These are the usual hot topics with HL learners. El subjuntivo, los tiempos perfectos, right? Los verbos reflexivos, right? Las reglas de acentuación, big deal. You got to teach them many times and practicing many, many, many times. Every day I have a, a, an exercise of that in class. Reglas de ortografía, la S, la C, la Z, la H, la G, la J, la C, la Q. Y pretérito imperfecto. I put it in parentheses because I was going to give you an exercise. And since we've already worked so much on the preterite and the imperfect, I was going to exclude that and ask you to pick out, think in terms of these elements for each of these. But we're out of time. But I, I hope you have the general idea. Uh, if you want to talk to me about it during lunch or any other time, I'm, I'm here and I'm happy to help you. OK, oh, I wanted to close with the big idea. Okay, those are the main points we've seen. And then the big idea is acquiring knowledge and skills and having them readily available from memory so you can make sense of future problems and opportunities. That's, that should be the biggest idea that's driving instruction. OK? And that's it. Thank you.